All right, if you want to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 9, um, I'm going to do a, a, a message today called Great Joy and Great Sorrow. Great Joy and Great Sorrow, and I'll explain uh, how I put those two together. But it is interesting to me, God gave me this message several weeks ago, and it's Romans 9, the first few verses, and Pastor Jimmy preached out Romans 7 and 8 last week, you know? So he preaches Romans 7 and 8, here I come in with Romans 9. And so I wanna show you about Paul, greatest apostle, this is right after he talks about no condemnation, Romans 8's a great chapter, by the way. No condemnation and no separation. It starts with no condemnation for those in Christ. If you're saved, no condemnation, and ends with no separation. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. That's pretty good. Whether you say amen out loud or not, you ought to say amen in your heart. No separation from God. No, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Not even you. You're not even powerful enough. So because, because it was your salvation is not dependent upon you, it's dependent upon what Jesus did. So no condemnation, no separation. But then he, he, he goes into Romans 9 and it's a little bit of a shock. And it's three verses that many people have never even seen in their lives. And they're shocking. And I'll show them to you. Before I hit Romans 9, let me hit one verse that Paul wrote to Philemon. It's verse seven. He said, we have great joy and consolation in your love. I just want you to notice great joy. I could have given you lots of scriptures where Paul talked about great joy. So he was a man of great joy. But we're gonna also see the words great sorrow and we're gonna put them together, okay? All right, so Romans 9 verse one. What he's about to tell you, by the way, is so amazing, he has to tell you that he's not lying. That's how amazing it is. Romans 9 one. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief, continual, in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Okay, you just read one of the most amazing verses in the Bible where the Apostle Paul comes off of this incredible chapter of no condemnation and nothing can separate me from God, but he said, I have such a burden and I'm telling you the truth in Christ and the Holy Spirit's bearing witness what I'm saying. We know the Holy Spirit's bearing witness because he put it in scripture. And here's, let me just sum up what he said in case you, the, the, I, I, could, I would be a curse from Christ for my brethren. Here's what he's saying. I would go to hell if they could go to heaven. That's amazing. For years, I did not understand this passage. I believed it because it's in the Bible. When I read something in the Bible, I believe it even if I don't understand it. The reason is, is because God's smarter than I am. So when you read something in the Bible, if you don't understand it, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with God's word. There's something wrong with you, not God's word. So I believed it for years, but I thought how in the world could he say I would be accursed? I'm so burdened if they could be saved. And here's the revelation I believe the Lord gave me on this. He's gotten to the place, remember it talks about the mind of Christ? He's gotten to the place that he's thinking like Christ. Because Christ said, I'll be cursed. So they won't have to. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Galatians, Christ bore the curse. So Christ made this exact statement, some, some, in essence, I'll be cursed. So he has great joy, but at the same time, great sorrow. Now, please hear me. It is possible to have sorrow and joy at the same time if you're a Christian. Let me say it another way. I say this at memorial services. Christians are the only people in the world that can grieve and rejoice at the same time. We're the only ones. Here's the reason. We grieve, the Bible says, 
We grieve, we do sorrow, we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. We do grieve, but not as those who have no hope. So you can be going through a, a very difficult time and still have joy. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, almost a year and a half ago, when I went through the medical uh, thing, I was thinking, I was I leaning over to Debbie, we sang a song at the South Lake campus that said, uh, out of the grave. He called my name and I came out of the grave. And I said to her, you know, these songs have a different meaning to me now. I think not just about being saved, but I think about the helicopter. You know, he called my name, I came out of the grave. I mean, I was as close to the grave as, as a human can get, according to the medical professionals. So I, I look back on that, and that was a very serious time in our lives. But we still had joy. We had sorrow, but we had joy. And uh, one of the things that um, I've told you before is I had night sweats, uh, for like three or four weeks because of the blood transfusions. And they said that's kind of normal. But I've never given you the background on the, the statement that came out of that that was a funny statement. What happened was I would have these night sweats and about every two hours, once I got out of the hospital, I'd wake up completely drenched. I mean drenched. My side of the bed was drenched. And we have a, a king-size bed that each side could kind of move e uh, independently and so uh, it's almost like two twins, you know, put together, you know. And so um, Debbie wouldn't even, she'd be asleep, but my, my side would be so soaked. Sheets, not just the pillowcase, we'd have to change the pillow. The pillow was soaked. And it was every two hours. And so I would not even have the strength, obviously, to, to help her. And I'd just dry, try to dry off and put a blanket on and sometimes just lay on the floor. But my, so my precious wife would have to get up and change the sheets every two hours. And so I'd go to bed sometimes around 11 or 12, around two, she'd have to do that. Then around four again, well around six, I'd wake up again, but I wanted, I slept more than normal during getting out of the hospital then, but I would then just dry off and, and get, we had this blanket and I'd just sit in a recliner just so she could get some more rest because she she was exhausted too. But so this is one of those times, it's four o'clock in the morning, it had been about two weeks of changing the sheets twice, okay? So that's, I'm giving you the context of the statement. She's changing these sheets that are drenched, and that's when she said to me, I think they gave you blood from a menopausal woman. <laughs> I, just, I just thought I'd give you the background of that comment. You see, see in your mind her changing those sheets and turning to me, you know, and saying that. Okay, so you can have sorrow and joy at the same time. It, it wasn't real joy for her, but it was funny. All right, so how, why did Paul say I'd go to hell if they could go to heaven? I think it's because he understood some things we need to be reminded of. And here's number one, condition. He understood the condition of lost people. I think we forget about the condition of lost people because it's been a while since we were lost for most of us. Uh, let me read it to you, Ephesians 2.12. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now watch this, having no hope and without God in the world. Having no hope and without God in the world. Remember a moment ago I quoted the scripture, we grieve but not as those who have no hope. Okay, without Christ, there's no hope. There's no hope. There's no reason to live. There's no goal. There's nothing to achieve. There's nothing to live for. There's nothing to die for. You're just, uh, according to what many say, we're just tissue, and once we're dead, it's over. And, and, and I had one businessman say to me, he became a millionaire when he was 30 years old, and it was back when million, I mean, error was meant something, you know, back in the early 80s. But he said to me, I remember I went through incredible thoughts of suicide. And, of course, and he said, that's what led me to Christ. But he said, what I realized was, if your goal is to get to the top, there's nothing to do when you get there except jump off. Because you, you, you achieved your goal. I was 30 years old, I achieved my goal. Why keep living? So no hope, no joy, maybe some laughter, but no joy, no peace, no purpose. I think we forgot about that. And one of the reasons I think we forgot about it is because we look at the external. 
We see the guy has a nice house, and we see that he has got, he got a new car. We're even jealous of his new car. And then we find out later that it, one of his kids got arrested for drugs, and, and he's going into rehab, and, he, and they're getting a divorce. Because we don't realize that without Christ, they, they have no hope. They have, they're without Christ and without God in this world. I, I just want to remind you that your coworkers, your neighbors, your family members that don't know Christ need to be invited in these next three weeks. <laughs> because they're in a condition without God that we need to be reminded of because we haven't lived that way for years. And so we forget how hopeless it is to live that way. I was at uh, Pastor Clark Whitten's church one time doing a presbytery, and most of you are familiar with that. It's where God, you, you, you give prophetic words to people that the Lord gives you impressions and, and you share with them, you know, and it's encouraging. And I, I looked out and I saw this woman, very well dressed, looked like she was very successful financially, but I saw a cloud of despair and darkness over her and I saw a cloud of suicide. And I knew things, I just knew things by the Holy Spirit. And so I, I, I went up to her when someone was on the other side of the sanctuary giving a word to someone, and I said, ma'am, um, I have a word from God for you, but I'd like to give it to you privately after the service. Would that be okay with you? And she said, I, I would actually appreciate that. I was hoping no one would call me out. I would like for you to, to give it to me privately. So I said, okay. So I said, will you meet me over here with the pastor after the service? She said, yes. So we met just down at the side over here. Had, I had Pastor Clark there. And I said, now, you need to understand something. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. I don't know everything. I'm not a psychic or anything like that. But God impressed some things on my heart. And I'm just going to tell you what God spoke to my heart. She said, okay. I said, your father abused you. And then you married an abuser. And you just turned 50. And you found out that your husband's having an affair and wants a divorce. And you were going to kill yourself this weekend, but you decided to come to church to see if God was real. And she started crying. And I said, God's not only real, but he loves you enough that he told me this. Because your life is not over, it's about to begin anew. And I shared with her about Christ and she accepted Christ right there. She, she shared with us, she was a medical doctor. She just turned 50. She was abused as a child, married an abuser, just told her he was having an affair, filed, he was filing for a divorce, and she had booked a room, which was her favorite uh, vacation place for that weekend to commit suicide. And she realized this is not the answer. She called one of her friends who was a psychiatrist had already met with her the week before, and the psychiatrist said to her, you ought to go to church. And the psychiatrist said, I'd like to invite you to my church this weekend. And she was sitting beside her when I went up to her and told her I had a word for her. She got saved. But from the outside, everything looked great. Are, are y'all following me? And, and you know another reason we don't understand the condition of lost people? Because we're watching the edited versions of their life today on social media. I don't know if you've ever like a, a movie and you watch this movie and it's great and then you read about it and you find out that the actors and the director, were, they were fighting all the time and all this behind the scenes stuff, but they edit all that out. That's exactly what social media is like. They edit out all the marriage fights and just show you the Valentine's dinner they had. <laughs> but not the fight they had on the way home. <laughs> all right, so one's condition. Here's number two, condemnation. Paul do their condemnation. Man, remember he said there's no condemnation, but you need to understand that prepositional phrase, for those who are in Christ. For those who are not in Christ, there's condemnation. But you need to know what condemnation means. Uh, we talk a lot about it, but I think most people do not know what it means. I think most people don't know the meaning of it, and especially from the Greek. So I said to Debbie, we were talking about this message, and I, she said, what are you gonna preach? And so I, I was sharing it with her, and so I got to this point, and I said to her, do you know the defin definition of con condemned in the Bible? And uh, she said, I guess it means to feel bad. And I said, well, that's what most of us think because we'll say I feel condemned. 
And we talk about feeling condemned, but that's not what condemned means. So I said, so what do you think it means? She sat there for a moment and she said, you're the preacher, you tell me. <laughs> okay, here's what the word from the Greek means, condemned. It means a death sentence. It means being found guilty of something and being worthy of death. It means a death sentence. So see, this is what Romans 8 is saying. There is therefore now no death sentence over those here in Christ Jesus. Okay, most famous verse in the Bible, again, just to, uh, what I say again, I'm gonna say because sometimes we don't know the context of it, John 3, 16, but the next two verses are phenomenal. I'd memorize the next two, not just 16. I'd memorize 17 and 18 also. Here's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For, for, in other words, so, since, because, God did not, he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, to put a death sentence on the world. But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not sentenced to death, eternal death. But he who does not believe is sentenced to death already. He's already condemned. See, God didn't come to condemn you. You were already condemned. He came to save you because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We were already condemned. We, you were born with a death sentence. You were born going to hell. And God didn't want you to go to hell. And you need to know some things about hell because preachers don't want to talk about hell anymore. You got a real problem if you don't want to talk about hell. You got a real problem if you don't believe in hell. You cannot say, and truthfully, you cannot, you could say it, but it'd be a lie. You cannot say you believe the Bible if you don't believe in hell. Because the Bible is the book that taught us about hell. No other book taught us about hell. You also cannot say you believe in Jesus if you don't believe in hell because Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. And the reason he did was because it's a reality and he's trying to warn people, try to keep them from going to hell. So hell is reality. But you also need, so, so Satan does all these logic, what, what seem to be logical questions in our mind. Why would a loving God create hell? Why would he send anyone to hell? First of all, God did not create hell for humans. He created hell for fallen angels. He created hell for Satan and his followers, the angels that rebelled against him. Some, some, some theologians say angels are about 20 feet tall. And I could tell you, explain to you why they say that. But the point is they're big. One angel killed 185,000 men in one night. That's, that's pretty good. 185,000 in one night, just one, okay? One angel throws Satan in the bottomless pit. One, one angel. When it's time for him to be thrown in the bottomless pit, you know, God tells Gabriel, go get, have one of the angels, you know, throw Satan in the bottomless pit. And Gabriel probably says, well, who do you want to send? I, I don't care, send the new guy. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Just make sure he says in Jesus' name. <laughs> so well, these angels are tough dudes and they rebelled against God. So God created uh, hell for Satan and every person, every angel, every being, let me say it that way, who follows him. Here's the problem, humans begin to follow Satan. Humans decided to follow Satan. And then the Bible, you know what the Bible then tells us about hell? Hell had to enlarge itself. God made it a specific size for Satan and a third of the angels that fell and hell had to enlarge itself. So God sends his only son so that you won't go to hell. But you need, we need to, we can have great joy, but we need to have a burden that we can't get over, and that is that people without Christ are going to hell. And Satan does everything he does to keep us from that. And I, I can remember, I, I pray that my burden remains strong. Um, I, I try to witness everywhere I go. When I first got saved, I, I would stand up in restaurants and tell the whole restaurant about Jesus. I think I learned that James Robinson sitting right down here. I traveled with James when I was about 20, I think. Met him when I was 18 and James would do that. We'd go in a restaurant to eat. He'd stand up to the whole restaurant, you know, about Jesus. So one time I was in Utah. <laughs> and I just had to. 
So I prayed about my opening line, and so I stood up and I said, hey, I'm, I don't wanna bother anybody, but I just have to tell you, I said, I'm from Texas, but I think Utah's one of the prettiest states that I've ever been in. Okay, that's a lie. <clears throat> But for a Texan to compliment another state, that's big, you know? And so they all clap. And I said, but I have to tell y'all, I said, I grew up going to church, but I didn't know God. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. A few years ago in a motel room, a guy told me, it's not not just knowing about him, you gotta give him control of your life. I said, I was on drugs, I was very messed up. I gave my life to Jesus, I've never been the same. And I just wanted to tell y'all, I love you enough to tell you that you need to give your life to Jesus if you've never given your life to Jesus. And I sat down, and they all clapped again. They all applauded. And three waiters came over and said, who were Mormons, and said, "Uh, we're Mormon, and we don't like what you just said. And I said, well, can you tell me why you don't like it? I said, what is there not to like about God giving his son for you? What is there not to like? And it was like the, the unction of the Holy Spirit came. I said, what is it not to like? That Jesus bled and died for your sins. What is that not to like? What is it not to like? You know, I just started preaching at him. <laughs> what is it not to like that God wants you not to go to hell? What is that not to like? And of course, the whole restaurant, they're just listening, you know. I mean, it's because I got kind of, and I started sharing with them. I said, you guys don't know Christ. I said, you're gonna go to hell without Jesus. And I just shared with them. And pretty soon, their eyes just welled up with tears. And I said, do you wanna accept Christ? Now remember, and I'd only been saved a year or two, you know, and so, and they, they all went, yeah. <laughs> and so I don't know why I said this. I just said, get on your knees, get on your knees. <laughs> get down on your knees right there. <laughs> and they all did, they all got on their knees, you know. And I said, say this after me, dear God, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I said, say it loud, I know I'm a sinner. <laughs> I know I'm a sinner. I asked Jesus for everything, well, they got saved. When they got saved, the the whole restaurant, it's like God filled the restaurant with Christians in in Utah, you know, for me. I'm telling you, you'd never know. But people are condemned already. God does not condemn people. It's very clear, God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world. They were, but you're condemned already. I think Paul understood that. Here's the third thing, is compassion. Condition, condemnation, compassion. Mark 6, 34, and Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion. I want you to remember the three words, moved with compassion. For them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So, because he was moved with compassion, he began to teach them many things. Let me say it another way. He began to tell them about the Father. Okay, the reason I want you to notice moved with compassion is because, again, I love the Greek. New Testament was written in Greek. Um, I love it because it is so much more of a descriptive language than English is. Moved with compassion is three words for us. It is one word in the Greek. It means to put action to your love. As a matter of fact, I want you to think about the word compassion. What's the root? Passion. Compassion, here's what it means. It means passion in action. In other words, you can love someone but not have compassion for them. Because when you have compassion, you'll do something. If if you really have compassion, otherwise you just have sympathy. But if you really love them, then you'll do something. That's why Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, the sorrow. He had sorrow and joy. He even said to the disciples right before he went to the cross, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. So he had sorrow, but he did it for joy. John 16, 20, he said to the disciples right before, after he said he was sorrowful, he said, you're gonna be sorrowful also, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Now, here's, the, here, here's why I want you to understand that you, you need to have sorrow for people that don't know Christ. Not a, not a, a sad, sad sack type of thing, but a, a, um, a reality of, of, of what their condition, their condemnation is. If you have great sorrow for someone that doesn't know Christ, then you'll have great joy when they get saved. 
But you have to have sorrow before you can have joy. You, you have to have, you know, weeping endures for the night, joy comes in the morning. The, the reason I think we don't get as excited as we should when someone comes to Christ is because we're not as burdened as we should be. We don't have that sorrow. It, like Jesus tells that the, the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost shepherd in Luke 15, I mean the lost uh, son, lost coin, lost sheep, and lost son, and here's what he says, there's great joy in all of heaven. Why? Because there's great sorrow. There's great joy because there's great sorrow. They have that burden. And, and let me show you something, this famous scripture about a burden. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28 through 30 says, come to me, all you who labor. Okay, anybody here labor? Anyone work? <laughs> okay, so that's you, that's me. And are heavy laden, watch. And I will give you rest. Now there's a key to having rest, to getting rest. You'll see it in a minute. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, do you know what his burden is? Let me, let me just, let me very simply define it for you. It's people. Yeah. That's his burden. Take my burden upon you, which is for the people that don't know me. Here's what we do though. We say, I have so many burdens, Lord. I just can't take another burden. I'm burdened about my finances, and I'm burdened about my kids, and I'm burdened about my job, and I'm burdened about the economy, and here's what he wants you to do. He doesn't want you to take another burden. He wants you to actually exchange burdens with him. What he wants you to do is he's saying, hey, 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 I'll take care of your future. I'll take care of your job. I'll take care of your finances. I'll take care of your kids. You take my burden on you, which is for other people who don't know me, and here's the, here's, the, here's the reward, you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. By the way, this is a two-person yoke. You ever seen a yoke? <laughs> so when, when Jesus is in one side, he does all the heavy lifting. As long as you're yoked with him and as long as you have his burden, if you have a heavy burden on you right now, it's because it's not his burden. Isn't that what we just read? He didn't say, he, he said, none of my, he didn't say, some of my burdens are heavy. He said, I have one burden. Take my burden on you, and it's light, by the way, and you'll have rest for your souls. I remember, let me just, of this burden, um, I remember the Lord uh, giving me a burden for my grandfather. I've told you the story before, it's in one of the books, uh, and other people actually have quoted it in, in books. I got another request this last week for someone to put this story in the book. Um, but uh, when my father was 16, who's seated right down here, um, he got to drive my grandfather to a house. The man working my grandfather shared Christ with him. But, but he said, would you like to accept Christ? And my grandfather said, no, I'd like to think about it. And the man very wisely said, well, if you ever want to accept Christ, pray a prayer like this. And my father sitting on the steps prayed that prayer. So my father came to Christ because of it but my grandfather had never made a commitment of his life to Christ. And so I think it was around 40 years later, I'd have to go back and do all the math on it, but um, I got this real burden for my grandfather. And again, it's a burden, but you can bear it because the Lord, it's, it's the Lord's burden. So I started praying and I realized in about a month we were kind of having a family reunion at this uh, lake house that my dad had. And so where all the families were gonna be together. So I started praying for an alone moment with my grandfather and that God would arrange all the circumstances and that God would prepare his heart. So we were, we were doing stuff outside or something and I went in the house probably to get an extra piece of pie or something just, just cause people that made the pie wouldn't be offended. It's the only reason I ever eat pie. <laughs> um, and, um, and my grandfather was in there. And I said, hey, um, can I talk to you a minute about something? I think he was 78 at the time. Um, and he uh, said, yeah, he said, actually, I've been wanting to talk to you about something. I said, really? So we went in the living room, and I said, hey, what, what did you want to talk to him about? He said, well, um, I've been thinking about what happens when I die.
He said, and I was wondering if you could help me with that. Now, remember, I prayed that God would prepare his heart. It was easy. It was simple. I shared with him how God didn't want robots, how he gave us a will, a choice, and that all we have to do is choose to believe in Jesus. And I led my grandfather to Christ that day. It's not a heavy burden. I'm asking you, ask God, Lord, will you give me the burden for the people you want me to have the burden for? And then I'm going to have passion and compassion. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to take action. These next few weeks, do you know normally we will see two to 3,000 people get saved? in our Bring a Friend series. Two to 3,000. Think about how that changes, not just them, but their children and their grandchildren and their legacy for generations. All because you invite someone. Just invite them. 